Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to the Illinois Paid Leave for All Workers Act, Unique Challenges for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Tom Lukemeyer. Tom concentrates his practice in the areas of labor and employment law with an emphasis in corporate healthcare law. In his healthcare practice, Tom regularly represents hospitals, group practices, and individual physicians in general corporate matters. He frequently appears before a variety of Illinois administrative agencies, including the Illinois Department of Public Health. I'll now turn it over to Tom. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, welcome again to everybody. Um, I am also the uh, the co-chair of the Labor and Employment Group here at Hinshaw and Culbertson, and, and um, we have been dealing extensively with the Paid Leave for All, all Workers Act and the unique challenges that this is presenting to all employers, not just healthcare employers. We're not going to go into the interplay uh, between the uh, the state law and the Chicago ordinances. Time is likely not going to permit that either. And moreover, we understand that um, there may be some amendments proposed to, to the new Chicago ordinance, and we're tracking developments in that regard. Hinshaw likely will set up a webinar for our Chicago-based clients on the interplay uh, between uh, the Paid Leaf Law All Workers Act and the Chicago ordinance at a later time. Now, that said, uh, this state law is not a model of clarity. Um, the regulations uh, answered some questions, but left more questions unanswered. Uh, the FAQs were a little muddy as well. So we're going to do our best to um, muddle through this uh, session today. Uh, so we're going to uh, begin with an overview of the key points of law, address uh, where the regs have clarified issues, and then present about eight scenarios, which are fairly commonplace in the healthcare industry. Um, and as I said before, despite the healthcare focus of this, uh, this discussion today will be helpful to anyone dealing with the new law. And with that, we'll get right into it. There's a wasted slide. We'll skip right over that one. So the Paid Leave for All Workers Act uh, is going to take effect in less than a month. All Illinois employers, regardless of size, are going to be required uh, to provide their covered employees for up to 40 hours of paid leave per year to be used for any purposes. The law principally excludes only school districts and park districts. Um, the law states expressly that an employer may use other paid leave policies that are currently in place to satisfy its obligation to provide paid leave under the Act. And most importantly, uh, and this is a point of some confusion under the law, uh, is that an employer is not required to modify its policy if the policy satisfies the minimum accrual required under the Act, which is 40 hours, and the employee is required to take the paid leave for any reason. So the key point here is that if an employer's existing policy is in effect as of December 31, 2023, as long as it provides for those two uh, requirements, then you do not have to modify uh, your policies. There is an ongoing debate about what happens when you have a policy that provides for the minimum accrual and allows the employees to take it for any reason, but your existing policy may have other terms that do not meet the requirements of the new act. I'll give you an example. Um, perhaps your policy requires a more extensive notice for foreseeable absences, or perhaps uh, it requires you to take paid time off in half day increments instead of the uh, minimum set forth in the act. As you will see, um, there are, uh, there are a number of questions that haven't been answered, and this is one of them. Uh, but there are certain elements that we believe an employer needs to incorporate in their existing policies, which means you're going to have to amend your policies if you want to be conservative. And those, I think, would be the posting requirements and the requirement to show uh, accruals and use of time on pay stubs. Um, however, an employer um, who would uh, is free to administer its policies according to its currently existing policy, uh, as long as they meet that 15A criteria. And I'll explain that a little bit. So I'm going to go to the next slide. 
here's the actual provision of the law. Uh, and as you can see, it says an employer who provides any type of paid leave that satisfies the minimum amount required by Section 15A is not required to modify the policies. So 15A, just so you know, raises only the minimum accrual, 40, 40 hours, and it raises the ability of the employee to take leave for any reason. It could have referenced any number of other provisions of the act. It could have mentioned them minimum required increments for taking paid time off or the notice uh, time frames, but it didn't do so. So I believe section 20B is worded this way for a reason. I do not believe it was the intent of the legislature uh, to require the wholesale revision of all employer time off policies come January. That said, however, if you're concerned about the issue and concerned that your existing policy may deviate from either the regs or the statute in a material way, separate and apart from the minimum cruel and separate and apart from the ability to use the PTO for any purpose, you can certainly amend your policy this month. And then it will satisfy the requirement that you have a pre-existing uh, policy prior to the end of the year. Quickly, uh, the provisions of the, um, of the state law would not apply to any employer that is covered by a municipal or county ordinance in effect as of the effective uh, date of, the, um, uh, of this act, which is January 1, 2024. Mm -hmm. um, any local ordinance that provides paid leave, including paid sick leave or uh, paid vacation time enacted or amended after the effective date, January 1, 2024, must comply with the requirements of the state law or provide benefits, rights, or remedies that are greater than or equal to the benefits, rights, uh, and, um, and remedies afforded under the PLAWA. And that's pursuant to Section 200.270 of the proposed regulations. Note I said proposed. They're still proposed. Uh, and uh, it's likely that uh, they're going to continue and may be made final in their current form, uh, but we never know. Now, if any of you do business in the city of Chicago, uh, you must comply with that act, and the paid leave for all workers uh, act will not apply. Now, I know we said that we wouldn't address the Chicago ordinance in this webinar or dive deeply into the interplay of those two laws, but keep in mind, the Chicago ordinance does not have a safe harbor uh, for employer policies that were in effect prior to January 1, 2024. And that's a material difference uh, between the two laws. Uh, so your um, uh, policies for those doing business in Chicago likely are going to have to uh, be modified. The definition of employee has the same meaning as used under the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act. And for those of you familiar with Illinois employment laws, you know that generally the definition of an employee is very broad. And the definition of, of other workers, such as independent contractors, uh, is very narrow. Um, and the use of uh, independent contractors is probably more prevalent in the healthcare uh, setting than in any other setting. But know that the that independent contractor status is under attack. Uh, and it is becoming increasingly difficult to establish that status with respect to many employment uh, statutes. So be careful if you are contracting with individuals that you believe are independent contractors. In most respects, you will find that they will have to be treated like employees under this particular act. And you will see how this plays out in our scenarios uh, toward the end of this presentation. But take a look at the uh, the definition of, um, of, or the exclusion from the definition of employee, which is really the definition of what an independent contractor is. They have to be free from control and direction over the performance of work. They have to perform work, which is either outside the usual course of business or is performed outside of all the places of business. The key there is, um, it has to be something which is not integral to the operations of the putative employer. And then the individual worker 
has to be in an independently established trade, occupation, profession, or business. The interpretation of, of those factors by the courts is becoming increasingly narrow, which means more and more individual workers are going to be considered uh, to be um, employees as opposed to independent contractors. The accrual is pretty simple. All employees, beginning on 1-1-24, or the start of employment, must accrue one hour of paid leave for every 40 hours worked. Uh, exempt employees uh, will be assumed to work 40 hours per week, uh, unless on a reduced schedule, and then on the basis of a prorated, ba uh, prorated formula based on the reduced schedule. The accrual must occur over a 12-month period, and it could be any 12-month period designated in advance in writing by the employer. You can do an accrual over time, or you can front load. Um, and if you front load, there's no carryover, as we'll see a little later. An unused leave for either, um, either scenario is forfeited at the end of the 12-month period. Now, when we look at hours worked, it, it includes all hours worked, including overtime, uh, but not paid or unpaid leave when not performing work. Um, the regs say that the 12-month period may be a consecutive 12-month period, and then changes to this 12-month period have to be communicated again in advance uh, to the employees. Now, there are many rules in the proposed regs concerning changes to the 12-month period. We're not going to get into those, uh, but everyone on this call, and I took a look at the attendees, many of you are human resource professionals, um, you need to be aware of all of the specifics requirements that you have to go through in order to change the 12 month uh, um, look back period. Also, if an employee is a part time employee and the employer is front loading uh, a pro rata amount, if the employee actually winds up working more than what you calculated in doing the pro rata calculation, then you have to catch them up. You can also have mixed use. Um, um, categories of employees uh, within your organization. In other words, some employees, if you're creating a policy just for them, and you will see in our scenarios, there may be reasons you want to do that. Uh, but you can have some employees who are on a front-loaded basis and some employees uh, who will be um, uh, earn their benefit on an accrual basis. The uh, paid time off benefit must cover um, any need for leave and obviously is not limited to illness. Uh, you can restrict employees from using the benefit in the first 90 days of employment. Um, and you may require up to seven days advance notice for foreseeable reasons for use. If a leave is unforeseeable, employees need only provide as much notice as is practical under the, uh, the circumstances. Now, um, Employers generally cannot uh, require documentation or certification to support an employee's need for leave or use of the paid time, and employees are not required to give a reason for the leave. Um, however, you know, that raises one of the issues under the regs and under the statute. How are you to determine if an employee comes to you an hour or two before start time, says I'm taking a day off, how are you to determine whether or not that leave was foreseeable or not foreseeable? Now, many employers use forms uh, for requesting vacation time or paid time off. And if that's part of your practice, part of your policy, you can continue to do so. Uh, however, remember, one of the key pro provisions of the act is that you must, be, must allow the employees uh, to use the time for any reason. Many forms that employers use are, are um, set up for purposes of scheduling and also to make sure that the right employer benefit uh, is being used. Um, it is okay and is proper uh, to use these forms for these purposes. So, for example, an employee may request time off because the employer, per policy, has a specific benefit for bereavement leave, a paid benefit. Um, you should be able to have them fill out the form, ask questions to make sure that uh, the right bucket of paid time off uh, is being used. So bottom line, uh, despite 
um, uh, the proposed rule in Section 200.300B, employers probably should be allowed and would be allowed to make basic inquiries to determine whether the use was foreseeable or not. Um, I envision the potential for a lot of abuse if uh, it's ever be is if it's ever interpreted to prohibit employers from even making this basic inquiry, because uh, um, many employees will never give advance notice, and and we all know that can cause some significant problems uh, for employers. You can set a reasonable increment for the use of paid leave, but it can't be greater than than two hours. You'll notice um, previously I made reference to a uh, uh, an example of where if your policy states that you have to use uh, your PTO time in no less than half day increments, whether or not your policy is is compliant. Um, again, uh, the the section of the statute that I quoted only makes reference uh, to section 15A, which deals with accrual and use for any purposes. So our position is that if you have a current policy uh, that requires use of paid time off in increments of half days or, or greater, you can continue to do so. However, if you wanna be extra careful and extra conservative, and you feel that this may render your policy non-compliant, and remember the regs or the statute don't necessarily imply that, uh, then we would suggest if you want to be careful just to amend your policy prior to year end uh, to uh, change the half day, for example, uh, to two hours. An employee must receive their regular rate of pay for time used. And you'll see that we have a... Um, a uh, uh, an example in one of the scenarios where employees are working two different types of uh, jobs for the same employer. But we'll we'll tell you how uh, the regular rate of pay should be calculated uh, for purposes of the paid time off, unless uh, an employer uh, is using PTO uh, policy for compliance. The employer is not required to pay for unused paid leave at the time of separation. However, if you're lumping everything together into a paid time off and relying upon your own policy, your pre-existing policy for compliance, then according to the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act, you will be required upon termination to pay the dollar value of the earned but unused vacation time. If an employee leaves and is reinstated in less than 12 months, the accrued time prior to separation must be reinstated. You'll see we also have a scenario dealing with PRN employees who really aren't ever terminated, uh, but they work sporadically, intermittently, sometimes fairly regularly, uh, but sometimes they don't. And we'll talk about how that works. One of the questions that's not answered by the FAQs or by the regs, but what happens with the reinstatement obligation if paid time off is paid out at separation? Well, I think it's pretty clear there's nothing to reinstate at that point because uh, the value of the paid time off has already been uh, um, dispersed to the employee. So, we talked about that foreseeability issue, and I predict this is going to be um, uh, one of the um, uh, bigger problems that are going to confront you uh, because your existing policies uh, may have notice requirements. And in fact, the statute has notice requirements, but the statute also, in a confusing way, indicates that we can't ask for uh, documentation related to the request for paid time off, nor can we delve too deeply into the reason. Um, the new proposed rules provide that if an employer, that employer can't deny a request to use paid leave, if the request does not meet the foresee foreseeability requirements unless certain criteria are um, satisfied, and they're set forth here. The key here is, is that generally leave may be denied only to the extent the request or the use uh, significantly impacts the core operational needs of the employer. 
Now, the regulations at Section 200.310C uh, uh, address this very point, and the regs identify the factors that are to be used in making that determination. And uh, the nature of the employer, whether uh, there are safety issues involved, the size of the employer, whether or not the employee performs functions that are critical uh, to ongoing operations, uh, and how you've treated situations um, in comparable situation, how you've treated comparable situations, all are factors which would be utilized in trying to determine whether or not an employer properly uh, denied a request for paid time off. Um, if you take a look at the regs at uh, 200.310C, you're going to see that um, it's a lot of lawyers' language. Um, it is, uh, I can make arguments for and against the denial of a request. And employers must, must absolutely make sure that they are on firm ground uh, with respect to the underlying basis if they ever decide uh, to um, deny a leave. Carry over. Employees may carry over up to 40 hours of paid leave from one 12 month period to the next. Um, the proposed rules issue this issued this month confirm an employer can set a carryover cap of 80 hours. It's interesting that nowhere uh, in the statute is that 80-hour threshold even mentioned. Uh, but here it is in the regs, and you know a number of uh, my colleagues and even some of my clients have uh, have referenced the fact that where are they coming up with this stuff? Uh, some of the things that are in the regs uh, have been deemed to have exceeded the scope of the authority that the IDOL, IDOL might have under the statute to create these regs. But they are what they are. Uh, I don't think the 80-hour um, max is such a big deal uh, because, uh, first of all, we're, we're talking about uh, a minimal benefit anyway, a one-week benefit, and probably most employees are going to be utilizing at least that benefit. And so I don't think the 80-hour carryover is going to be all that significant. The uh, proposed rules are consistent uh, with the statute in that an employee can be restricted to using a maximum of 40 hours per year if you're going by the, uh, the act itself unless the uh, employer sets a uh, more generous restriction. As I uh, just indicated, um, with respect to foreseeability, if uh, you are going to require uh, notice when a reason is not uh, uh, foreseeable, uh, it must be in a written policy uh, with notice procedures. And this is dependent upon whether or not you're talking about an existing policy prior to year end or a new policy. Obviously, any new policy enacted after January 1, 2024, must strictly comply with the requirements of the statute. It's important to note that if you are using your existing policy to comply with the requirements of the Act, uh, or you're mingling this time uh, with a PTO vacation bank, any unused leave must be paid out at separation of employment. I mentioned that before, uh, but it's worth uh, repeating again uh, because that is an easy way for an employer not only to violate this law, but also to violate the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act. Other notable provisions of, um, of, of the act include the fact that an employer cannot require an employee to seek or find a replacement worker as a condition of taking the time that's available under the Act. Like many Illinois uh, employment laws and even federal employment laws, uh, the Act includes anti-discrimination and anti-retaliation provisions. Um, and then most importantly, employers cannot consider use of paid leave as a negative factor in any employment decision that involves essentially any term or condition of employment. That includes evaluations, promotions, discipline, um, or even counting the paid leave under a no-fault attendance policy. And that's an important one as well. They're entitled to take the leave. There should be no negative consequences 
as a result of, um, of doing so. Record keeping and notice. One of the things that will be mandatory is the IDUL will be um, uh, publishing uh, a copy of a new poster. Um, and you're all probably familiar with, with uh, required postings, whether they be federal, such as OSHA, or whether they be Illinois, such as for minimum wage law purposes. Um, but that must be posted in a conspicuous place on your premises and then you can you must include a copy of the notice in a written document to the employees or in a written employee manual or policy. Um, most of you will probably be handling it in the latter. If the employer's workforce includes a significant portion of non-English speakers, it will be required to post notice in this language. And then the IDOL will also provide a, a model statement on that as well. What is a significant portion? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but I think as a, a rule of thumb, uh, that if um, you have a complement of employees that comprise approximately 10% of your workforce, I would, um, uh, in, as a matter of caution, uh, provide the notice in their native language. You have to maintain accurate records for each employee. You have to show the work, the hours worked, the paid leave accrued, and the paid leave taken, as well as the remaining paid leave balances. Um, the statute says that this uh, information must be provided to an employee upon request. However, uh, the proposed rules, specifically in section 200.250, state that during the duration of uh, an employee's employment, an employer must provide an accounting of the unused balance of paid time on each pay stub uh, or form that the employer normally furnishes to employees to notify them of wage payments and deductions from wages. Typically, it's on a wage stub. So you, if you're doing this on your own, there are some things you have to add to your pay stub. If you have a vendor such as ADP, you want to work with them closely and make sure that uh, that um, the checks and the pay stubs that are issued by the vendor are compliant uh, with the PLAWA. Um, I would imagine uh, that almost every employer, excuse me, um, payroll provider and vendor uh, that's uh, working within Illinois is aware of this law and is aware of the pay stub requirement. Illinois Department of Labor Enforcement. Uh, very similar to a, a wage claim process. And for those of you who have been unfortunate enough to have to deal with those, you're probably familiar with it. But here, the, the statute contemplates uh, that employees may file a complaint with the Department of Labor within three years of an alleged violation. Uh, now, there's no reference to a private right of action with direct um, filing rights uh, or access to the circuit courts of the state. Uh, but there is an administrative hearing process, which would have to be followed before the Illinois Department of Labor. Violations can lead to individualized form of damages. Those damages would include the underpayment itself. In other words, the failure to pay vacation time when it was uh, appropriately due. Compensatory damages, um, which are damages uh, related to humiliation. I don't want to call it pain and suffering, uh, but they are not what I call equitable damages, which are used to make the employee whole. It's an additional sum of money. Um, attorney's fees, of course. Uh, the state is always very good about making sure that employees uh, have access to lawyers and get their attorney's fees paid. What's the reason for the focus on attorney's fees? Uh, it's because often uh, the amount at issue is not that significant. Uh, and without uh, a fee-shifting provision, Many plaintiff's lawyers, for example, might not be so eager to accept the case. So attorney's fees could be 10, 20, 30 times the amount of the underpayment. So it's very, very important uh, for uh, employers to make sure that they are in compliance with this law 
uh, because the risk is not in the underpayment or even in the the, the individual penalties that could be assessed. Uh, it's really in the attorney's fees. Uh, for violating a notice or posting requirements, employers will be subject uh, to a $500 civil penalty for the first audit violation and a $1,000 civil penalty for each subsequent audit violation. So what are our recommendations uh, as we uh, move forward? Uh, and these are self-obvious, or you, you should know them right away. Review your existing policies. Do you have a policy uh, that's require that's excuse me compliant with the 15a requirements in other words the minimal accrual and the ability of employees to use it for any purposes if you're going to make changes whether because you believe they're necessary or because you want to take a conservative approach as we've indicated uh, make those changes prior to January 1 2024 and publish those changes to your employees so the policy is existing and you will want to consider different levels of um, benefits for categories um, not previously included in vacation or, or PTO uh, policies uh, you can have um, uh, perhaps some of your categories of employees or some of your employees never received them before now everybody is entitled so you may want to consider a multi-tiered uh, benefit approach that takes into consideration the re reality of the healthcare setting, where you have a lot of temporaries, part-times, PRNs, um, or individuals working on a unusual or or non-typical uh, work week schedule. Um, we have quoted here the uh, uh, the uh, site to the regs, and of course the FAQs are also somewhat helpful. So let's go to the scenarios. We're about halfway through, and that's exactly where I thought we'd be, just going through the basics of the law. And so what we'll do here is we'll talk a little bit about um, the various scenarios. And I'm going to go through eight of them. And then hopefully there will be some time left for any questions that have been uh, posted. So in scenario one, a hospital employs a number of individuals who are PRN, which is based on the Latin phrase, by the way, pro renata, and translates as needed. I always throw in Latin because I took Latin in high school. I'm one of the probably the few remaining dinosaurs who ever, who ever did that. Uh, but it certainly comes in handy, especially if you're going to be a lawyer. R.N. Jones works PRN for Illinois Central Hospital. And by the way, all these names are made up. And as you see some of my names later, you're probably going to be very happy these are made up names. Um, but she works PRN for Illinois Central as it fits her lifestyle. Sometimes she will work for two straight weeks, covering for a vacation, and not work again for months. Uh, the frequency of her assignments vary based on the hospital's needs and, and uh, Nurse Jones' own schedule. Now, not all of Nurse Jones' work is in Illinois. As sometimes she works for an Indiana hospital that's unaffiliated with Illinois Central. Nurse Jones, however, also works for Illinois Southern, which is affiliated uh, with Illinois Central and in the same healthcare system. None of the referenced hospitals have included uh, Nurse Jones in its PTO plans by virtue of her status, PRN. This is common for many hospitals. PRN employees don't earn a PTO benefit. So if Ms. Jones works for a month for Illinois Central in July of 2024, but then doesn't work again for the rest of the year, well, um, what happens? Well, looking at Illinois Central only, and let's forget about Illinois Southern for the time being, Jones accrues a paid time off benefit under the, um, under the act. She is entitled to um, that benefit, that minimal accrual of one hour for every 40 hours worked, up to 40 hours. But she hasn't worked 90 days under my example, uh, so she can't use the time. So if she works again after 90 days and within a year, uh, her time is rolled over or reinstated. This example is, is not based on the regs, but uh, the regs sort of give us the answer. 
And the section of the regs I'm specifically referring to is section 200.300, and it is example D. Now, we have to be very, very careful about joint employment. According to the proposed regulations, uh, joint employment is going to be considered by the same criteria as under the regs for the Illinois Minimum Wage Act. And for those of you who are taking notes, the specific regs for joint employers are found at, in the, excuse me, the Illinois Administrative Code, Title 56, and it's Section 200.115. And there are a number of factors that are utilized, uh, but you will see that they are very vague factors. Um, and it should be very easy uh, for an employee to make an argument, um, good faith argument, that a second putative employer may be a joint employer with respect to the enforcement rights of, of this law. Um, they have to address a number of factors, including whether or not the employee's work is for the benefit of the secondary employer, whether the work performed uh, by the employee is integral to the operation. So consider Illinois Southern and Illinois Central, and uh, Nurse Jones works PRN for both, accepts assignment from both. Perhaps there's a centralized method where she's working registry or PRN for both. Um, and one of the factors is whether or not the putative employer, in other words, the one who didn't think they were a joint employer, um, in this case, it could be either Illinois Southern or Illinois Central or the parent company, was the putative employer in direct or indirect control over the employees? Indirect control. That could mean by virtue of a policy or a procedure or anything else. Uh, we do know that joint employment is a concept uh, that is expanding. Um, and we know that there are initiatives, for example, under the National Labor Relations Act to expand the notion of joint employer. So you have to be very, very, very careful. If you go to those regulations that I just cited, they gave a couple of scenarios, uh, and those scenarios really demonstrate just how broad the concept of joint employment is. Um, in one of the examples, a hospital contracts with a security company to provide armed and unarmed security guards 24-7. Um, and while this, the security company provides guards for any number of clients, perhaps even any number of hospitals, uh, it, uh, they're still found under the scenario described under the regs to be a joint employer. And the reason is, is the hospital employs a chief of security who's responsible for communicating, uh, the hospital's needs to the security company and, uh, assuming both sides, putative employer and the employer comply with the act, there's not a problem. But what this means on a practical level is that if you have vendors, um, you're going to want to make sure that they are also in compliance with the requirements of the act, or else you could find yourself like the hospital in the cited example uh, to be considered a joint employer with the, with the security company. And that triggers, obviously, risk for all of the statutory penalties, the attorney's fees, and the statutory damages. For those of you who are in home care agencies, there's also another example under those regs, which demonstrate the breadth and um, um, uh, how easy it is to establish joint employment. Um, in the example they gave under the regs, the home care agency was deemed to be a, a joint employer with uh, the husband and wife uh, who directed the care for another family member, the home health care. Uh, so all three, the husband, individually, the wife individually, and the home care agency were all deemed to be joint employers and severally, severally liable uh, for any infractions. Uh, so it's very, very important that uh, as human resource professionals, you take into consideration uh, these issues. Scenario two. Okay, let's stick with Nurse Jones. She reside, resides in Charleston, Illinois, which is 
I actually spent um, a good quality week trying a case in Charleston, Illinois, and I know it's not too far from the Indiana border. Uh, so she works for an Indiana hospital in August 20, uh, 2024. And um, uh, the question is, is does her status as uh, an Illinois resident um, uh, earn her time uh, under the act? The answer there is no. Now, Illinois Southern employs Nurse Jones for a full month in September, and then again in December. Uh, Illinois Southern is controlled by Illinois Regional Health System, uh, which is also the parent of Illinois Central. Illinois Southern maintains its own separate compensation and benefit system. So what are her rights with respect to Illinois Southern? What happens with respect to Illinois Central? And can you create a separate policy uh, with respect to PRN employees? So with respect to Illinois Southern, she could begin using her time 90 days after she first started accruing it for Illinois Southern. Does Illinois Central's situation change? It could, because remember in scenario one, I indicated that she hadn't worked for 90 days and hadn't worked again, and therefore she couldn't use her time. But if Illinois Central and Illinois Southern are deemed to be joint employers, then she is going to be able to use the time she accrued for Illinois Central because she will be deemed to have satisfied uh, the 90-day requirement. Now, remember, you can always um, uh, maintain separate policies for different categories of uh, employees, and that is confirmed in Section 200.240 um, of the regulations. I was just handed, oh my gosh, about six pages of questions. We'll see, uh, we'll see if time permits those. And again, as I said before, if we don't have time to get to the questions, we will answer each and every one of these for you. Let's go to scenario three. Illinois Northern employs hospitalists on a one week on, two week off basis. And up to this time has excluded them. Um, in other words, the um, hospitalists from that category of worker from paid time off benefits. They're paid an annual salary. The hospital looks at this as if, well, wait a minute, we're paying you an annual salary. We set that salary uh, basically to uh, compensate you uh, for paid time off. And we're expecting that you will use that paid time off on your, on your, uh, um, on uh, times when you're off uh, for those two week purposes. Do they earn benefits under the act? Number one, of course they do. If the salary already includes um, uh, compensation for paid time off, can the professional demand or is entitled to extra paid time off? The answer there is probably yes. Um, and then are there ways to address this situation? So one of the key questions is we know that under the act, employees must be able to use their paid time in the week when they are on or when they want to use it. So the conservative approach for dealing with professionals in your institution who previously were not included uh, within, the, um, uh, within your policy uh, to create a separate policy just for them based on the Paid Leave for All Workers Act um, and allow them to uh, earn on an accrual basis uh, up to 40 hours of paid time off and allow them to take it at any time. One less conservative approach is that the hospital could require the hospitalists to schedule their time in advance. In other words, when it's foreseeable. More likely, it'll be scheduled during the two week off period when they're not working. More likely than not, but not necessarily so. But a hospital can never require that. You then can assume that without contrary notice from the worker, uh, that the paid time off will be scheduled and taken uh, during their two weeks off over a reasonable period of time, maybe the first three months or the first six months of the 12-month uh, period. The real challenge for hospitals is going to be on tracking the time taken so pay stubs can be accurate. Make sure your hospitalists commit to paid time off or scheduled vacations as early as possible in the year. 
you want to make sure that you can prove uh, that even though for every week they work, they're off two weeks, uh, you want to be able to prove that they actually exercise their rights under the act and uh, took the paid time off. Scenario four, some of the uh, hospital's workers are covered by a collective bargaining agreement. Now, it typically in CBAs, for those of you who um, have unionized settings, uh, typically CBAs have three-year terms. And this one's set to expire on June 30, 2024. So what does the hospital follow as of 1-1-24? Uh, the CBA uh, or the Act? Pursuant to the Act, um, you can follow the terms of your CBA as long as it was in effect as of the effective date of the new statute. Now, the hospital, or HR of the hospital, I should say, says that they've started negotiations already uh, for the renewal contract coming up in June of uh, 2024, and they expect to be done by March 31 of 2024, uh, even though the renewal won't be effective until 7-1. The union has said, ah, don't worry about it. The CBA provision on vacation trumps the act uh, even after January 1, 2024. Is that accurate? No, it's not. Um, for new agreements, collective bargaining agreements, that is, that come into effect after January 1, 2024, they must be compliant with the act. The union also says uh, that a negotiated vacation provision is sufficient as a waiver. Now, the statute says that if you have um, a, a union management agreement, a collective bargaining agreement, the union can waive on behalf of the employees the requirements of the act as long as there is a clear, unambiguous, and explicit waiver. The union would be wrong in saying that merely renegotiating a new vacation provision is sufficient as a waiver. Perhaps it would be sufficient as an implied waiver, but that's not what the law requires. So there is a lot of precedent, not under state law, and certainly none under the PLAWA, uh, with respect to what constitutes a clear, unambiguous, and explicit waiver. Uh, but there is under federal law, especially with regard to uh, arbitration provisions and forum selection with regard to statutory claims, such as a discrimination claim under Title VII. At the very least, if you're negotiating a new collective bargaining agreement, you must identify the law that is the subject of the waiver. In this case, it would be the PLAWA. And the CBA must have a clear statement that pursuant to their status as the exclusive bargaining representative of the employees in the bargaining unit, they have waived any application of the PLAWA with respect to uh, the work setting. Absent explicit reference to the law and absent an express reference to the waiver, you will not be meeting likely the requirements of a clear, unambiguous, and explicit waiver. And if we adopt the requirements of federal law with regard to the interpretation of what constitutes a clear, unambiguous, and explicit waiver, uh, then you'll have to follow those two rules, which I just mentioned. Scenario five. Happy Trails Nursing Center has an existing paid time off policy and a separate extended sick pay benefit. Uh, the paid time off benefit meets the requirements of the PLAWA. The policy that the uh, hospital or the nursing center has says that its extended sick pay benefit kicks in after an employee has been out for three days. Now, Alice is an LPN who is out sick for two weeks. Happy Trails said uh, that she must uh, use the extended sick pay benefit uh, after three days. And no exceptions on this use requirement are permitted by the nursing center. Is this okay under the requirements of the PLAWA? Well, first we know uh, that um, Alice, the LPN, accrues benefits under the, um, under the uh, act and she accrues benefits under the policy of the nursing center. 
The law requires the employer to allow the employees to use the time for any purpose. But the law doesn't say anything about employer requirements that they have to use the time in a certain manner. So while they can use it for a certain um, reason, there may be limitations on how the time is allocated between various benefits. Again, if you have a policy in place before year end 2023, you can impose this requirement, the same type of requirement that Happy Trails Nursing Center had. It is not so clear that if the policy is enacted on or after 1-1-23, because, excuse me, one one twenty four, because the employee would have the right to designate the time he or she wants to use. So the very conservative approach, if you find yourself in a situation like this, where your policy already says that you have to use one bucket for three days and another bucket for any remaining time, the best approach is to modify your policy before year end and address this situation if it hasn't already been addressed in your policies. Scenario six, James is an RN who works just two 12-hour shifts in the emergency department each weekend. Now, James and his brothers and sisters have started their own landscaping business, and this part-time schedule works really well for him. But under the hospital's plans, uh, and based on the number of shifts he's been working, he doesn't qualify for any benefits, whether it's health benefits, paid time off, or otherwise. Now, James also signed up for the in-house registry, and when business is slow uh, in um, landscaping, that's usually in the winter months, he works extra assignments at the hospital and departments which can utilize his services. His uh, rate of pay for weekend uh, work is quite a bit higher than his rate when he works registry. So how do you compute the rate of pay? So before we get to the rate of pay, I do want to mention to you that um, um, he is covered under the law and he is going to earn time off regardless of whether under the act that is regardless of whether he's working registry or working his uh, 12 hour shifts in the emergency department now if there are two different rates for these two different types of work um, how do we compute the the rate of pay well let's call them rates a and rates b you First, multiply the total hours worked for rate A, and then multiply the total hours worked at rate B. Um, add those two sums to, or add those two numbers together, and then divide by the total hours worked, uh, both as registry and as um, in the emergency department. And that will be the compensation rate that you will have to pay, um, uh, or continue, I should say, when the employee takes paid time off. Um, you'll probably find, you know, that scenario six, especially in hospitals, reflects a fairly common, um, common situation uh, when people are, are um, employed uh, to work specific shifts or at specific times. Let's go to the next uh, scenario. Code Blue Memorial uh, has two issues. Uh, first, it provides its executive staff, and I'll call executive staff vice president or above, and department heads with what is known as unlimited vacation benefits, uh, pursuant to a written policy they have. Under this policy, these uh, administrative executives can take as much time off as they want and continue to receive their pay. However, they do not accrue at a specific PTO rate or for a specific benefit i.e. a four-week benefit, for example. They receive no defined front-loaded benefit, and upon termination, they receive nothing uh, for their any unused time because it's assumed it was unlimited and you could take as much as you wanted. Can this policy be deemed compliant uh, with the PLAWA? So first, let's make it very clear. If you do have an unlimited vacation benefit for a high level employees, and it's another topic for another time, but you should only use it for high level employees, um, it must be in writing. And you can make an argument that is compliant because the executives can take more than 40 hours. Now the Chicago ordinance actually addresses unlimited vacation, but the PLAWA is silent on the topic. 
A conservative approach would be to apply the same rules at the state as you would under the Chicago um, uh, ordinance. And what that means is that the executive must have a reasonable opportunity to use the time granted under the statute for any purpose. Um, and you would probably want to consider modifying your unlimited uh, paid time off uh, policy to state that um, there is a mandatory minimum time off requirement. That would be a very good idea. Everyone should take at least one week off in that per policy. An important flag for employers also is to make sure uh, that uh, the executive requests the time off and is documented. You want to make sure uh, that uh, there is documentation of both requests, or in other words, scheduling, and the fact that they took it uh, so that you can comply with the record keeping requirements, perhaps the payroll uh, stub requirement. Or the fact that if the unlimited vacation benefit is ever challenged, you can show that they actually have no damages because they took time in excess of uh, what's been um, offered or what's required, I should say. Scenario eight, backwater health. I was having, you can probably tell I was having fun with Code Blue Memorial, and now I'm in backwater health. They have trouble recruiting physicians to service the community. Uh, so what's happening is the primary staff, or excuse me, the primary care docs on staff are not employees. They're independent members of the medical staff. And like a lot of smaller hospitals in rural areas, they the doctors may also be on staffs of other hospitals. Given the rural location, following patients in the facility has been difficult for the admitting primary care docs, and Backwater uh, wants to engage hospitalists to address uh, the service gap. However, no large hospitalist vendor is willing to provide services given the hospital size, their volume, and perhaps the location. Therefore, Backwater has been contracting with various primary care physicians again, independent members of the medical staff who are not employees to provide the services. Several, the hospital has wanted to make them part-time employees, but several of them have indicated they will not work unless they can contract uh, with backwater as independent contractors. Uh, Human Resources has told the president of the hospital that they would be considered employees under the PLAWA and must be allowed to earn the benefit. And ring, ring, the hot president of the hospital calls the lawyer and asks, is this true? And the answer is pretty clearly, uh, it is true. Um, this is an example of likely the very narrow application of the status of independent contractor. The state does not want employers to avoid the law by an inappropriate use of the status of independent contractor. And here... Um, you can see that the hospital services are integral to the operations of the hospital. They're probably performing those services pursuant to regular policies of the hospital subject to uh, the oversight of the chief medical officer. Uh, so it would be very difficult to establish independent contractor status. Um, but if you want to pursue the fiction and uh, perhaps against legal advice, uh, then I would create a separate paid time off benefit just for that category of physician, which is consistent with the act, even though you're titled them as independent contractors. Now, I was just reminded here that I am only a minute out um, from, um, uh, from the end of the session. And I do have in my fingers here uh, some questions. Um, they wanted to, one question is whether this act applies, uh, applies to part-time employees, and it does. And it means that you can prorate the benefit for those part-time employees. Uh, let's see if I have a couple more. Can we designate a rolling 12-month period rather than uh, 12 specific months? Um, rolling based on what is going to be the uh, the question. Um, most uh, employers are either going to uh, do a fiscal year 12-month period, a calendar year 12-month period, uh, or a 12-month period based on anniversary date. Those would be the, uh, the, the three most uh, prevalent. Can you restrict current employees from using paid leave in the first 90 days 
uh, following January 1, 2024? The answer to that is yes. Another question. So if unforeseeable, we then can request documentation for the purpose of determining whether the request was indeed unforeseeable. Um, that's a tough question. And that specific question is not answered by the proposed regs. There are conflicting provisions, which would seem to suggest you can ask for some basic information. Certainly can't ask for a lot of documents. You certainly cannot be intrusive. Uh, and I think most employers are going to solve that problem primarily with the use of policies and forms, uh, which require you to request it in advance. For salaried managers, is the increment of two hours applicable? Um, generally speaking, uh, whatever minimum increment uh, that is required, it's going to apply to employees whether they are salaried or not. Um, you can take a half day of vacation and schedule it to go to the Cubs game, for example. Let's do one more here. We currently pay out vacation when an employee leaves. Uh, can you clarify as this is correct moving forward? Well, if you are paying out your vacation pursuant to a written policy um, that exists prior to December 31, 2023, then you continue to follow the terms of that policy. And if an employee terminates and they have earned but untaken vacation time, um, then you have to pay it out. If, on the other hand, you are uh, creating new policies uh, after January 1, uh, 2024, for categories of employees who um, weren't previously covered by your written PTO policy, then you do not have to pay it out upon termination. Um, you have one hour. Okay, I, I lied. I'm going to do one more because I thought it's interesting. One hour earned for every 40 hours worked. How does that work with overtime? Well, you count overtime hours for purposes of this act as one hour. So if you work 50 hours, 10 of which are overtime in a week, you've earned um, uh, 50 times the minimum accrual uh, for the uh, paid time off benefit. So it's one hour for every hour worked, one times 50. Now with that, we're a little bit over. Uh, I wanna thank you very much for attending. And keep an eye out for another notification because we likely will be doing another webinar uh, with respect to the Chicago Ordinance and the interplay with the PLAWA. Thank you, everyone.